Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Megan Delaney for Grand Rounds this morning. Dr. Delaney is the um, Chief of the Division of Pathology and Lab Medicine and Director of Transfusion Medicine at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. She is also the Professor of Pathology and Pediatrics at GW, George Washington University. Um, Dr. Delaney serves as a member um, of the Board of Directors for the AABB, the um, BEST Collaborative, and also on the American Board of Pathology Test Development Advisory Committee. Her um, research interests include clinical pathology, laboratory medicine, transfusion medicine, and, um, tra and pediatric transfusion medicine. She um, is particularly interested in global health, and she focuses on improving access to safe blood transfusion in developing nations. And that brings us to our talk today, She, the title of which is Access to Safe Blood Transfusion in Low and Middle Income Nations from Big Data to Mosquitoes. Dr. Delaney, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohn, and to my dear friend for inviting me to come speak to this group. Um, it's amazing. You guys have 42 folks on the call already. So um, good morning um, from Washington, D.C. To, to those of you in Minnesota. It's actually supposed to go up to 70 degrees here today, although this morning I was wearing my down coat. So it's one of those weird weather days. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, as Dr. Cohn said, access to safe blood transfusion in low and middle income nations. And hopefully, you know, for, for many of you which are pathologists on the phone, you know, we often are, you know, supporting, working so hard to support our patients here that are in front of us in our hospitals and our facilities. Um, and, and hopefully you can sit back and, and start to, you know, take in, you know, some of my stories today um, to think about, you know, the rest of the world. And in particular, I'll focus on Africa um, and, and how um, they get along um, being able to access uh, safe blood transfusion. Um, so, so starting with um, Dr. James Blundell, um, who is credited as providing the first human-to-human -human blood transfusion um, in the 1800s, and he was an obstetrician, and, and he was providing this blood transfusion from a husband to a wife, and she had just delivered a baby and was having a postpartum hemorrhage. And although um, many hospitals in high-index countries now have effective you know, massive transfusion protocols and are able to save um, a woman's life when um, those kinds of incidents happen because of their high risk of morbidity and even mortality. Um, there's actually um, the preponderance or most of the mortality that happens with postpartum hemorrhage actually occurs in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and it's for the same, they don't have enough blood where they need it. Um, and so this talk is going to um, talk at different levels um, of different projects that I participated in, um, and also, you know, share some pictures and some of my experiences because um, it, it, for people that, for when, when you don't um, see for yourself or, or hear about it, 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 it actually can be hard to understand um, how different the practice of transfusion medicine can be um, in low and middle income countries. So we're gonna explain the global need for blood transfusion and how disease prevalence impacts that need I'm going to talk about a project we did about um, really focused at the hospital level in low and middle income countries. And then I'll tell you a story um, that is sort of my be my beginnings in, in global public health um, around blood transfusion because it, it's very complicated and, and will hopefully leave you with some 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 future thinking about about how uh, business and industry and finance is really um, impacts um, the health of populations. You know, so as I mentioned in my opening slide, uh, you know, bleeding is the number one cause of maternal mortality worldwide. Um, almost all of the deaths um, by, by, by number are, are actually in sub-Saharan Africa for maternal mortality. Um, malaria, which we'll talk about a little here and then more at the end of the talk, um, is, is a very prevalent disease in places where the vector thrives and children um, are disproportionately inf uh, impacted with severe malaria that can cause their death. And in some uh, studies that have been published, that actually the majority of blood used in some hospitals in Africa is actually used for pediatric transfusion to support uh, anemia caused by malaria. Um, the traffic accidents and, and traumatic accidents, injuries, um, that, you know, it happens across the world, um, but it does, 
certainly um, in the, the infrastructure of poor roads, bad lighting, um, older vehicles, and not being able to access a trauma center does also account for significant need for blood transfusion in low and middle income countries. So I'll, I'll just put some pictures in as we go, just, just to give you some, some idea of, of what it's like to, to go to blood banks um, in different countries. Um, by no means are my pictures um, all encompassing. Um, they're just images that I think if, you, if you're trained in transfusion medicine and laboratory medicine that they might stand out to you as looking quite different than our experience in the United States. Um, so for instance, um, this is a poster from Ghana talking about um, to, a, a recruitment poster um, to enroll as a blood donor. And, you know, to me, it was striking because, you know, how, how firm and, and dark the language is, what the blood bank is bankrupt, um, you know, which is quite different than a lot of the marketing messages that are used um, in our country about um, inspiration and saving a life. Um, and just sort of, to me, portrays the concern around not having enough blood. And this other picture in Uganda, this is the, the uh, in Kampala, the, the, the Ugandan National Transfusion Service. This is their cold uh, storage room. This is all blood that's been collected. And just some things you'll notice is that, you know, why is it sitting here? Um, it, was, it was sitting there because it was waiting to be tested. Um, and you'll also see that it doesn't look like there's labels on it that we're used to, the ISBT label with the big bold uh, blood type. Um, in, in many countries that I've traveled, that, that there is no label like that. In fact, the, the, the blood type is written with a pen on the, on the label that, that comes on the blood bag when it comes out of the box from the manufacturer. So this just shows that here it doesn't appear that they're not collecting enough, but the, the chain to get the blood tested, labeled out the door, does have problems in that chain. And of course, now after COVID and our experience we've all just lived through, you know, that supply chain really makes a lot more sense about how complicated and where those, those, those holdups can happen. So I'm going to, um, you know, tell you uh, four separate stories that are all quite different from each other um, to describe uh, things that I think, you know, bring together um, the status of blood transfusion in, um, in low and middle income countries um, and, and using science in different ways. So we'll start with estimating the global need for blood. So um, this is a study that I was part of that I, I'm really proud of because of, um, you know, just sort of how we, we tried to port portray the need in, in a different way. Um, and, and this was uh, published by uh, collaborators uh, of mine in Seattle. It actually came from uh, Dr. Fitzmorris's um, K-12 study. This was her idea. She was a hematology fellow at the time um, at University of Washington. And so what, what her idea was, um, was that there is a, um, a way that the, that the WHO um, estimates how much blood products we need to take care of our patients. And it's done as a ratio to population. And when you really think about it, as I just pointed out, you know, different diseases need different amounts of blood, right? Um, someone who has heart disease would need, in, in their lifespan of that disease, would need a different amount of blood than maybe someone who has cancer. And so what Dr. Fitzmorris, and then we all became collaborators on this work, was can we model, uh, based on disease prevalence, um, how much blood is needed per country? And I, and I want to also, you know, give a shout out to, to where the, some of these databases came from and a plug about global public health. So uh, Dr. Fitzmorris and my other co collaborators were working at an institute called the IHME, or the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. This is based in um, Seattle at the University of Washington. And the, the really the visionary leader is Chris Murray, and he's a physician and health economist who has made it his life's work to measure disease in the human population around the whole world. And it's called the Global Burden of Disease Study. And every, every few years, the IHME team comes out with a new measurement of the prevalence of how people die around the entire world. And then these data have, be, and, and he's got teams in every country try, figuring out how, what diseases people have and how people die to try to bring precision around those measurements. And so he, this book is a, his, his a, a biography about him. It's excellent. Um, but that's where some of these data come from. So, so going back to our study and what we were trying to do is that we wanted to know how much blood is needed at the national level so that the, that country could target how much blood they actually needed. 
and, and here's the, the, the what the WHO says. And it, it's not it's not wrong what WHO says. It's just very generalized, right? So WHO says 10 to 20 donations per 1,000 population. Well, if you've got a lot of one disease or another disease, maybe your numbers are different. And so that's what this study was trying to do. So starting to get into the modeling, um, and the first two authors on that article, they are really the, the modelers and the computer programmers to the statisticians. So if you start with the population profile, and you know if you think about there's unidentified transfusion needs due to lack of access to care, this study does not measure that. Um, unidentified transfusion needs resulting in demand. And then there's de the red would be demands not met by the supply. The green box in the middle would be demands met by the supply. And then, of course, there's also in inappropriate transfusion demands. And then this shows the transfusion supply. So these are the boxes we were starting to work with to set the model up. Going another level deeper is sort of this was the approach of this modeling exercise. Now, now remember, it's all based on that global burden of disease numbers and some other models. So, so this is not that we went out and did a head count. Um, these were based on other, um, other databases that did some head counts and some modeling using other databases. So first we wanted to estimate, so we needed to have an ideal transfusion rate to compare the, the, for each disease to compare, okay, for disease X, you need five units. For disease Y, you need two units. So that's number one. We needed to estimate the total disease-specific transfusions given over time in the USA. Now, we, we actually hemmed and hawed about using the USA as our idealized. I'll talk about that a little bit more. It ended up being the one we had the most, the best way to construct the model. Um, but of course, you might think, well, maybe we transfused too much in the US. So, so I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, then we divide the total specific disease-specific disease transfusions by the U.S. disease-specific prevalence, and then determine the lowest disease-specific transfusion rate over time to make this the ideal. Okay, and then we multiply the ideal specific transfusion rate with the disease-specific prevalence rate by country. Remember, that comes from the Global Burden of Disease Study. And then we can estimate the country's total transfusion supply, and then separately, we, have, we had data that had been reported by country to the WHO about how much they have. So then we could actually do a gap analysis. We could say our model says you need 10,000 units and you say you have 5,000 units. And so the gap is 5,000 units, right? So that's, this is the, the, the broad strokes of the model that was set up. This is sort of looking at it as, as math or a math statement is that if, if it is known how much blood is needed on average for a specific diagnosis and the prevalence of that diagnosis in a population, then the total transfusion need can be estimated. So as I, as I mentioned, we, we had to use a number of different databases to construct this pretty dynamic, complicated um, model. So we used what's called the HCUP database um, for, um, to get the US um, the beginning of the model, the, these two, number one and number two, are the how much is transfused by diagnosis, right? Trying to get to that idealized uh, transfusion rate by diagnosis. And then um, in green, again, it's just calling out that one of the keys to this study was that we were able to use the IHME Global Burden of Disease Study a data to, to say that, well, these are the prevalences, the prevalence of those different diseases. And we did this across 195 countries. So just a little sidebar about that idealized transfusion rate. Um, so we actually published two papers. We published the paper about, we published the, the bigger paper I'm focused on, but just so you know, we also published a paper about blood transfusion trends by disease category in the US from 2000 to 2014, because that was the way we were able to get the idealized transfusion rates. So we published this as a separate paper. What we found is that there was a decline um, that decreased from, 20, um, from 2011 to 2014, sorry, those years are flipped. Um, and the decline occurred in most disease categories, um, which did point to what we said in this paper is it pointed to strategies like patient blood management being effective and disease specific improvements, like maybe changes in surgical technique or optimization of um, anemia management. So 
just the, from that paper, again, the U.S. paper, um, the blood use by our calculations peaked in 2010, and these were the top indications. And you'll see here, you know, in these databases, nutritional deficiencies. So that's most likely anemia or iron deficiency anemia potentially. But these are big categories because we're talking like database. All we can get from them is what the how they were coded. But this was the paper that helped us make the quote idealized transfusion rate um, for the global paper. Okay. So turning back to the global paper, I have a few colorful results slides to show you. And I'll just talk through them um, as, and, and eventually we'll look at maps, which I think makes it make the most sense. So what we found is this is the estimated need by region and diagnosis. And it's a little hard to see at the bottom, but you can see that there's um, the, the blues are injuries, digestive diseases, the purples are respiratory and tuberculosis and nutritional deficiencies. The green are neoplasms and maternal and neonatal disorders. There's also musculoskeletal. Orange is chronic respiratory diabetes. The black bars all the way at the bottom, but you'll see there's more of them at the bottom of this graph, are neglected tropical diseases and malaria as well as HIV. So if you take this in as a gestalt, you can see that actually Central Europe, Eastern Europe, high income Asia Pacific, high income North America actually have the greatest need by diagnoses compared to what you see more at the bottom, which is more of the Sub-Saharan African nations and the Indian Latin American nations. Okay, so just sort of remember that as we go through. This is how much blood is needed by the diagnoses reported in those countries. So now we're gonna look at some maps. So, Th what this one shows is that sort of similar data, but um, the blood need adjusted for population and diagnoses. So it's a little different. Now we've adjusted it per 100,000 population per country. And so, um, although it's, it's somewhat similar, but the colors have shifted. So the red and orange are showing high blood need, okay, based on who lives there and what diseases they have. And then as it gets to yellow and green, it's lower blood need per 100,000 population. So, you know, why is that? Well, some of the red and orange countries might have old, more older people. Um, there's a lot of epidemiology probably, you know, that is that is behind what we're seeing here. Um, there might be uh, the, the overall population may be younger um, in, the, in the yellow and green countries. And in addition, it might be that diseases are not recognized, so therefore not cataloged in some of those countries. That's, of course, a weakness of the model. So what about the supply? So... Um, as I said, we, we additionally, that last step in the model building, we, we were able to obtain um, what the countries had reported to WHO on how much blood they have. Okay, and so we had data from 2011, 2012, 2013, and we aggregated this over all components. And so this is saying these countries are reporting how much blood they have. So the red is very little. The dark green is a lot. And then the middle green is quite a bit, and, and then the orange is sort of not so much, right? So you can see that, you know, again, uh, the Russia, Europe, um, some of some of the Asian countries or the Middle East, the North America, some of South America has quite a, a bit. They're po they're saying they have a lot of blood per their population, whereas Sub-Saharan Africa clearly stands out as red and orange. They do not collect a lot of blood. You can also see India and um, and other countries in Asia that are reporting um, not have, you know, 500 to 2,000 units per 100,000 population. Okay, so this is sort of the, the bringing it all together, the last map I'll show you for this study. And this is the gap analysis. So this is the estimated global need to supply ratio, again, based in the prevalent diseases that need transfusion in those countries. So this is sort of the summary take-home message. So the dark green is saying that there's a matched supply or oversupply, like significant oversupply. The light green is twice the need of supply. And then the dark red is not up to, with South Sudan as the example, is probably the worst one, 75 times as high the need over the supply. So this really focused us off <laughs> on some countries, and you can see how many of them do exist in Sub-Saharan Africa, that, that they really, that 
the diseases that are there that have been cataloged that need a certain amount of transfusion, the amount of blood that's collected does not meet the need. So these were our conclusions um, that the transfusion needs really differ hugely based on local demographics and disease profiles in the region. Um, many countries face critical undersupply. This will also, we think, become more pronounced as access to care improved. Um, and really, there's a large unmet need for government support, financially, structurally, establishment of regulatory oversight to ensure quality, appropriateness, and safety. Now, I'll be talking about that a little bit more in our other studies. You know, this study was a really exciting study to be part of. I, I'm really proud. We This study was actually picked up. It was published in Lancet Hematology. It was picked up by multiple news sources. Um, the Science Alert, and actually India, a reporter from India um, talked about, used this study to talk about the need for blood in India. And, and even NPR Science, um, Goats and Soda picked this up. So, so it, it was good. It felt good to, to get this word out. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done to improve um, access to blood in, uh, low, in, in many countries in the world. Um, so now um, I'm going to talk, up, kind of shift ears and, and, and actually talk probably for this audience um, much closer to home. And what I mean by that is, you know, what's happening at the hospitals, right? So I, that was really big data talking about uh, databases. But what about like what's happening at the hospitals? You know, here at Children's National in D.C., we have a blood bank and a donor center, you know, and we're running, we're doing the day to day of taking care of patients and, 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 and supporting our donors. And of course, if they have an event, supporting them as well. So just a few more pictures to just, you know, talk about um, some of the countries that I've worked in in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and been able to support um, some great scientists doing some great work in these places. Um, the Lodwar County, Kenya, this is a, the very northern part of Kenya, and it, it's near uh, Somalia to the north, and it's very dry, um, has pastoral um, cultures, um, distant, great distances. Um, there's also, you know, local gangs. It's not always safe. Um, and, and so, you know, if you need to donate blood or get health care in, um, in, in a place that's so rural and so far from Nairobi, the capital city, it's a plane ride or a very long, dangerous road ride. Um, you know, there's not blood really being shipped from there. They, they really need to collect it locally. Um, this is a picture from Salima County in Malawi, and this looks like a typical African town. Um, and, and, you know, just to show you that when we're talking, when I'm talking about these things that, you know, a major driver of not having resources in the healthcare system is poverty, right? And, and so, um, you know, we have so, we have such a resource rich environment where we work compared to, to much of the world. Um, this is a, another picture. This is a picture from the hospital in, in that Lodwar County, Kenya. And, and I took a picture of this poster that was on the wall. Um, and I just wanted to point out something that really kind of stood out to me. You know, I focused on, on the transfusion of children. Um, and this was, they were tracking their visibility board of um, admission trends for their pediatric ward. And if you see across the bottom, it says Kala Azar, right? That's Kala Azar, that's leishmaniasis, right? So, so talk about a neglected tropical disease. And, and when I was looking through their, their books of um, who was getting transfusion, the diagnosis sometimes for children getting transfusion was Kala Azar. I mean, so it's so, it, it's just disease that is so, um, you know, a, a scourge of, of poverty and of these environments um, and, and difficult, right? That, um, that if, you're, if you have these kinds of diseases and malaria and things, you know, it's hard to pay attention uh, if you don't have enough resources to, you know, let's collect enough safe blood. Um, so then also just a few more pictures um, from, from this hospital where um, the, the, the picture on the left, you know, they were doing malaria smears. We were looking at malaria smears together, and, and it was the dry season when I was there. And they said, oh, about 1 in 10 is positive right now. But they go, but in the rainy season, it's 9 out of 10. Um, and they're writing the results in the book. The patients um, have the results in a book that they carry. Medical records is, is a very different operation in most of the African hospitals. Um, this is um, doing blood typing um, on, a, on a slide. Also, it's often done on a tile. Um, and then here, um, another thing that I, I have seen woven through all of my trips and all of my uh, time working there is that you can see here, these look like blood refrigerators that might be in our refrigerator, in our rooms, in our blood banks. You can see they, one of them was, was donated by USAID. And, and so what you see time and time again is that the wealthy nations donating equipment 
um, to, to low income countries, um, is particularly laboratory equipment. And I cannot tell you how many times I see that it's broken. Um, you know, when you think about our laboratories, we always have our preventative maintenance being done. We have, you know, expensive contracts with vendors that when something breaks, they come in that day and fix it. You know, and I was there looking at these. Um, I'm not actually, I don't actually think these, I think one was broken, but one was functional. But the thermo one on the right that actually had quite a bit of blood, you can sort of see it through the window. Um, the, there was no power um, right then. And so for a while there had been no power. So, so the refrigerator was actually not cooling. Um, it was just holding the blood, but it was not cooling. And it was a hot day that day. Uh, and this is just um, a hospital in Malawi that uh, this room here is where they collect or place in blood, blood donors. Um, and uh, I just heard some sound. Maybe make sure you mute yourself, please. Um, but they, they collect blood donors here themselves. And, um, you know, just looking at the, the status of what the, ho the hospital looks like. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, this is what we call replacement donation, meaning that um, that the, the patient really pulls in their own donors um, to be able to have enough blood for their procedure or for blood that was, sometimes they'll say the blood is loaned from the blood bank because it needs to be replaced back. They generally do not have a stock of blood. So this is that hospital's blood bank. And I think there was like one A unit, maybe one A, B unit. Um, the technologists that I've worked with are highly trained. Uh, very professional, um, and it's just the conditions. There's a lot of point of care testing, um, not a lot of instrumentation, except for some disease specific instrumentation. So, you know, you'll see that there's a lot of money in HIV and tuberculosis. So, there might be tests available for those diseases because of the foundations that support that work, but maybe not for all the things that we're used to. And then this is just showing the card about doing the blood typing here. So, you know, with that little intro, I'm going to talk now about the status, uh, a survey that, that we did that was published in BMJ Open um, last year. And this was looking at, you know, this type of thing. What, what's happening at the hospital, the transfusion service level in low and middle income nations? And um, Linda Barnes uh, led this uh, through the AABB uh, Global Transfusion Forum group. A few of us uh, supported this project. And so uh, what we did is that we sent out um, invitations across the world. Um, to as many contacts as we could get, um, trying to obtain um, up to two responses per country. And it's, it's a challenge. Um, we sent out 124 invitations. There was 50 responses from 27 nations. And then these, um, this is the countries that responded. And I want you to know that these low, low middle and upper middle, those are World Bank designations by their uh, their economic measures. We we don't make those up, um, and so we also published. We also did it, the survey in multiple languages to make it accessible to to as many people as possible. Um, and we our response was um, predominantly urban and teaching. So so even though we tried very hard to get the the world of all different types of transfusion services, still the folks that responded there was a bias to probably the bigger ones that were more. Um, engaged in this work, um, meaning that a community hospital that's just doing transfusion to get by probably didn't respond. We didn't many, get many of those, those respondents because the median of 6,000 units per transfusion service was, is actually kind of big. So here's a map showing um, the response rate. And you can see, although it's, it's not, you know, tons and tons of countries, it's 27 and it does represent uh, different parts of the world, Central America, South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, and Asia. Um, and so, you know, I'll just tell you what we found. Um, it's very much a descriptive survey. Uh, so, you know, most of the hospitals collect blood. So, so that's, that's, you know, it's actually a pretty, it's very common that the hospitals collect blood. And if you see it broken down here, um, that, that of the ones that collect blood, those two first two bullets, some of them also can collect, uh, obtain blood from their external supplier, but they also have to collect their own because they just are not given it, they're, they're not provided with enough. When we ask the hospitals how they recruit, um, you know, about half of them just say, you know, we have posters and we, you know, we do an open call. Um, you can see that 33% do require this replacement of, donate, of donated, uh, of transfused blood. Um, and there was no monetary incentives reported. You know, the indications for transfusion are also um, here. 
and you know they're the usual transfusion indications. Um, you know, you can see adult anemia, adult cancer, elective surgery, trauma, cardiac surgery, pregnancy, pediatric anemia. So they're not to me. There's nothing um, you know surprising here, but you know it's interesting that there's adult anemia, non-malignant um, is, is high, and that could be also malaria. When we ask them about barriers and challenges, um, that that a pretty significant number, 57%, state that when blood is ordered, that it's not it's common it's common for it not to be immediately available. Okay. And so when we think about, you know, in, in our situation, how stressful that is um, when you, you know, you know, but sometimes, you know, patients in, in, some, in, in some of these hospitals are waiting a day or two days or more to, to, for blood to be available. Um, a, a lot of them cite having inadequate supplies as well. So even if they have a donor, they might not have a blood bag. Um, and they sometimes need special matching. And typically, in my experience, that's about RH or ABO. Uh, not about minor blood group antigens. Um, there's also a lot of um, awareness of uh, the need for clinician education and um, and also a lot of awareness by the people taking the survey and we hear at other places that you know adverse events, um, workforce sufficiency, these, these things that are, are similar to what um, I think we all experience if you take a transfusion service call. Um, but you know, the one that really stands out to me, too, is the financial model. And the more that, you know, I work in this space, I really find that, you know, the way that the Ministry of Health um, uses its limited budget, you know, it, it does impact these things a great deal. Um, but if you have to make choices, um, you know, sometimes they might choose insulin, buying insulin over buying, you know, buying blood bags or whatever it is, you know, um, because there's not enough uh, resources to go around. Um, you know, I also have a, a deep love for immunohematology, and so we were able to ask a technical question about compatibility testing, um, and I've done other studies that I, I'm not going to talk about today about, about access to red cell reagents, you know, to do antibody screens, and so we were able to ask them, it's a pretty complicated slide, you know, how are you doing compatibility testing, and the, the left is the low income and the low middle and the upper uh, middle income countries and what each of them is is first is cross match and the green is gel the blue is tube and the orange is slide so that that what you saw in the pictures and then antibody identification um, antibody screening and patient blood typing now remember the, the there is this is somewhat of a biased sample because um, you know in many hospitals there is no antibody screening. Um, and it's all done on tile or slide. Um, but you can see as you move to those upper middle income countries um, that that there's even gel available, right? So you can sort of see the green get bigger and the blue and orange get smaller, which is sort of taking in that they that as there are more resources in the healthcare system, they're able to do more sophisticated pre-compatibility testing. You know, and there's very little published, um, especially if there's a, just a few papers published in, from African locations about, you know, hemolytic transfusion reactions or recognizing a transfusion reaction. Um, but there is there are some that suggest that it is under recognized and it does happen. So the conclusions of of this um, study, you know, is, you know, it was it was the most at the time comprehensive survey of of the hospital based transfusion services in low middle income countries. Um, it's important to understand that hospitals are collecting blood um, in addition to performing laboratory testing. Um, and, you know, they're collecting blood because there's not enough. They're not, there's not a national service that's able to supply. If there is one, it's not able to reach them or able to supply their needs, um, or there isn't one. Um, and then the blood shortages and implications for patient care are really felt by many. Um, and what we also really were struck by, it's really hard to capture those data systematically. In the WHO <clears throat> survey that the countries submit, um, there's not really not much about that. And I, I know in the U.S., in the, the looking, thinking about uh, hemovigilance and also um, I think in U the U.K., the shot data, there's more recognition that we should capture when there's not enough blood or the patient is delayed. Right, because it hasn't been something that has been focused on both in high index countries and in, in the countries in this study. Um, <clears throat> okay, so.
So um, I'm going to now talk about a story, you know, sort of a personal story that was very eye-opening for me about, um, you know, the the workings of the system and and how um, and how malaria, in particularly, impacts uh, transfusion. So, you know, as I mentioned at the, at the top, you know, malaria it has an enormous burden on the human population in the places where the vector is distributed. Um, and really, the children um, are the ones who are the most impacted. The, the first few infections with malaria are the ones that are most likely to pose fatal. Um, in some hospitals, it's documented that that is the need. That's where most of the blood is transfused, in particular in the rainy season. Um, and so when I was doing my master's in public health, um, I was already done with my medical training. Um, I was focused on global health, and I really wanted to learn about um, transfusion in Africa because now I was a transfusion doctor and I was really wanted to know well, well how how is the rest of the world doing with with our field um, and so uh, my mentor at Puget Sound Blood Center which is now Bloodworks um, Dr. Tom Price introduced me to a Ghanaian um, man named Daniel Samua who um, had trained at Puget Sound um, for a few months um, and then uh, was back in Ghana and and so Daniel, you know, invited me to come. And so my public health project was I did a, an assessment of transfusion services in Ghana. Um, so when I started to learn about where I was going, um, I found out that that uh, Mr. Samua worked uh, for a hospital that was funded and supported by this company called Anglo Gold Ashanti. So what this company is. Um, a mining company. It's a South African based company that is in, in Ghana in, in a town called Abwasi, which is a few hours north of the capital of Accra, um, was um, gold mining in, the, in that town. Um, and so as I started to learn more about this and more about the company, it was, you know, really eye opening. So this is some of the, um, you know, materials from, from the company's website. And so, you know, they say in their own documents and, and, you know, that, and you can see here, this is where their uh, mining operations were. And a great number of them were in the red zone, which is the malaria zone. And, and in their, in their business um, materials, they say that malaria remains the most significant public health threat to their company. Um, and that if you superimpose their mines on the malaria map, you can see this. And so, you know, additional data. Um, from their materials is here. And so this hospital was the Abwasi Mine Hospital called the Ed Edwin Kade Hospital. Um, and in the rainy season, they could see thousands of malaria patients per month. Um, and a significant proportion of them were mine employees. The rest were the family that the hospital took care of the whole community. It was a really, uh, really nice facility, very, um, very advanced. Um, and, and then though, just doing the business math, you know, they were talking about if there's an average of three days off per patient, it equates to 20, 7,500 man shift hours lost per month. And then when they're not feeling well, the workers um, have a slow rate of work and the medication treatment. And, and so they, there's just the, the company was like, not only is our communities that we're working in very sick, um, you know, it really impacts their bottom line. Um, and so, you know, as a as a younger person too, I was really struck by this. I was, you know, I I, I have my own, you know, personal feelings about mining and, and what that does to our environment. But this was a really interesting, you know, thing to think about that how how the mind thinks about malaria. Um, so, you know, what they did is they started this really advanced um, and and really now gold standard uh, malaria control program that was modeled after I think another one um, that had all of these these sections of the um, of the of how they were going to control malaria in their in their area where they where their community was, um, and so they were going to do vector vector control, which is um, typically indoor residual spraying. So so what they do is um, going to the houses and the buildings on a rotating basis, and they would take all the furniture and put it in the middle of the house, and then they would spray all the all the walls and and all and dump all the water. Um, that standing water to try to put the pesticide down to kill the vector, the mosquito. Um, and they would distribute nets. Um, again, the water bodies would be treated. Um, they did a lot of tr um, education and environmental management. And then they had a pretty, um, th that, that also advocating use of repellents, information education, but they also had this laboratory 
um, which is here, that was, and you can see some of these pictures of the labs where they were actually continually uh, testing the, the, the mosquitoes against the pesticide they were using, and they would rotate it to ensure that the local mosquito species and was not gaining um, resistance to what they were spraying. And then you can see here the, the, the gentleman in blue spraying uh, the pesticide. Um, interestingly, at the pediatric section of the hospital, we, we also saw because of the spraying, um, exacerbations of asthma because of the, the actual the pesticide. Um, you can see the community events and, and then some of the leaders. So, you know, the, it was a really interesting thing to see. And we ended up, uh, Daniel and myself, uh, we published a paper in Vox in 2010. Um, and during, during our time there, we pulled these data from their records. And so what we looked at was um, how that activity, that really um, orchestrated and well-resourced malaria control impacted the need of children to get transfusion. Right. And, and remember, like, you know, they're kind of on their own getting transfusion, meaning the hospital is collecting and testing it themselves. They're not getting it from a, a big central supplier. Um, and so what the black bars show here is uh, 2003 and then the white is 2009. This was sort of before and then after uh, the, that big program I just described was put into place. And you can see at the, the first set is the number of patients tested. And I think we looked at July 2003 compared to July 2009. And we were literally looking at handwritten books of these data. I'm extracting them from that. Um, and so it's kind of like an audit study of those months. Um, so patients tested um, was much higher than um, after. So meaning that there was fewer patients presenting with symptoms. And then the next few is showing um, the malaria positivity. Um, before and after. And so the first one is malaria positive um, just overall. And then this next bar is zero to five year old children. And then the lower one is five to nine year old children. And then the next set after the where it says malaria po positive children needing transfusion, this is um, the subset of children who also need a transfusion. So you can see here this very obvious decline. There's less malaria, there's less children with malaria, and significant that, that decrease in the little kids from zero to five. And then there's really significant less children who need transfusion. So all really good things. Um, and so, you know, it, it's even though the, the whole program was not set up to decrease how many times a child in the town needs a transfusion, they did, they did just that. Um, so, you know, this to me was a Interesting because, you know, as I've worked more um, and connected more with people in the Ministry of Health and, and county executives who have to distribute that health care budget, you know, it, it, the sustainability of having enough resources to have a safe blood transfusion system is, is a real issue. And this just shows how well when one company was there and had resources, what they were able to accomplish. So um, for my last little story, I'm going to talk about, you know, what I've been focused on now. Um, and, and so that is a, a program, a new, a newer, newish program called the Blood Safe Program. Um, and this is uh, funded by the NIH, and I'll tell you the story of how it got started. But the goal of the Blood Safe Program is to enhance the availability and delivery of safe blood to be used for transfusion in patients from low and low middle, middle income countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And the goal here is that the NIH is, wants to support projects that develop, test feasible, effective, and sustainable strategies to improve access to safe blood. And they specifically wanted it to include locations that are both urban and rural because the, the, the pressures and the barriers are, are different in those areas. You know, so this, the history of this, of the program being developed is, is over a number of years. Um, and, you know, the NIH every so often held holds a state of the science as sort of a listening session to hear from the community what studies need to be done in different fields. And, you know, they, we recently are putting one out for transfusion medicine. Well, they sort of did a similar, a mini version of that, talking about blood availability and transfusion safety in low middle income countries. They had a workshop in 2017, and it was co-hosted by NHLBI and Citrus, which is the implementation science part of NH, NHLBI. Um, in 2018, a published a paper was published by the leaders of that workshop, 
Um, and then in 2019, they took all of that learning and they submitted a request for applications out into the public so that people could apply for the grants that they were putting out there. And in 2020, which was right when COVID descended upon us, um, the, the NIH chose uh, three study, three African study teams and one data coordinating center. And I will tell all of you at University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota is the awardee for the Data Coordinating Center, or Dr. Kevin Riley, and, and uh, Dr. Claudia Cohn is actually also on the steering committee for this project. Um, and, um, and then in 2021 and 2022, which is the years that are just closing now, was the assessment phase of this, the, 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 the awardee studies. Um, the, and, you know, why am I talking about it? <laughs> so um, the, the NIH asked me to be the chairperson of the program. So, you know, I apply, I supply uh, mentorship, administrative uh, leadership support, you know, on behalf of the NIH uh, for the, the three project teams in the Data Coordinating Center. There's also with the ESMB. Um, and the Blood Safe Research teams um, that were awarded are in Kenya, Malawi, and Ghana. Um, and again, it's, it's a program under the NIH, which includes um, the Division of Blood Diseases, as well as the Center for Translational Research Science, which really the studies need to be implementation science studies. Um, they're, they're really not basic science studies. They're really trying to, how can we sustainably improve access to blood transfusion in, in Africa? Um, and I'll just call your attention to, we just published a paper um, in transfusion that is the, that describes our, the program and, and each of the investigators um, described you know, the status of their, the, the blood services in their countries, as well as a little bit about the studies that they're undertaking. So, um, you know, that, that, those are all my stories for today. Um, I, I hope that, it, you know, you were able to, you know, hear, hear my, my main message that, you know, the world does not have enough blood where it's needed. Um, certain prevalent diagnoses such as malaria increase demand for transfusion and, you know, can impact different populations, as I showed you with, with the children, with malaria in Ghana, um, and that hospitals, many hospitals collect and test blood for themselves due to lack of external suppliers and to replace the blood that is used. Um, mo many hospitals do not have all the resources that, that we typically use to perform pre-transfusion testing. There's not a lot of study or, or data about what the impact of that is, but there's a little bit to show that there is some probably unrecognized hemolytic reactions or other. Um, and that really, it's not, this is not an easy, an easy problem to, to, to fix. Um, it's going to take years of dedication and education and about policies, research, and financing through different approaches um, to support health. And I just want to thank a few folks that I mentioned, um, Dr. Tom Price, and this is Mr. Daniel Samua. He actually received the Hemphill Jordan Award from the ABB for some of his work, which is which is great. Um, Dr. Christina Fitzmorris, um, who was the, the initial uh, idea around that blood modeling study, and, and Dr. Linda Barnes, who um, is was was someone who co-led that that transfusion survey with me. So that's all I have for today and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Megan. That was, um, that was fantastic. Uh, uh, before, uh, does anyone ha have uh, questions for Dr. Delaney? Uh, yeah, Claudia, I do. Uh, Dr. Delaney, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, in my career, I've done a lot of transfusion medicine and have been interested in uh, international health. Uh, uh, I, I actually have two questions. Number one, um, uh, a number of years ago, I interacted with a, uh, a woman from India who uh, was involved in transfusion, and she told me that they they were doing uh, malaria uh, smears on every unit. And you showed a picture of a person doing a malaria smear. Um, that seemed terribly labor intensive to me, and I wonder if you would comment on that. And and the, and the second question I have is, how many of these countries are actually doing full component transfusions versus uh, just uh, whole blood red cell transfusions? Yeah, um, Dr. Crossing, great, great question. So a few, a few, a few answers. Um, so I've I've seen so about trend, malaria in the blood supply in general it is not tested for. So when I was showing you malaria smears, that was patient diagnostic testing part of the lab that had nothing oh, to do with transfusion. Really? It's generally not tested for. 
Um, different countries might have different policies. I remember seeing an old policy, and this is dated, they might have changed it, where um, I think it was Ghana. It was like a transfusion guide. It, again, it was more than 10 years ago. It said something like, if a patient receives more than two units of transfusion, you should just treat them for malaria. You know, so, so there, really? it, there, yeah. Um, now, the other thing about diagnostics is in the, uh, the study I showed you that I published um, at the Edwin Kade uh, Hospital in Ghana. They were using the rapid test for malaria parasite antigen. So it was a little uh, lateral flow ELISA assay. Um, mm -hmm. And then they would confirm with a blood smear. So some, like the one I showed you in Malawi, diagnostically, they're just going right to smear um, and just do, and they are fast. And the malaria are just there. It's not like the very occult malaria cases we tend to sort of see in the US that are imported that you're searching. That right. It is so obvious. But, um, but some do do some do use the rapid. Um, the other question was about components. Um, so there there certainly are um, hospitals and blood centers that are creating components, platelets, uh, frozen plasma, um, occasionally cryo. But the vast majority of blood, at least in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is transfused, excluding South Africa, which is a very advanced transfusion system, um, is whole blood. There's there's some fabulous there's a fabulous set of randomized control trials in children um, that have severe malaria in the New England Journal um, called the Tract Trials and they were looking at they 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 were randomizing children that presented with severe anemia mostly malaria um, to to how much transfusion they were receiving and some of them were getting whole blood and some were getting red cells and they basically showed that the kids do better either one that they get. Um, so it, it is sort of it you know when when it's that dire you know they show up with a hemoglobin of three or something like that that you know hope blood's just as good as red cells in that situation but there are components um, but I I've seen you know platelets being created in the shelf life and all these cold chain the chain issues not always not being used being wasted because they can't get to where they need to be. Okay. Bacon, there's a question in the chat. In yeah. order to increase eligible donors within regions of Africa, or I assume sub-Saharan Africa, should we um, be focusing on ameliorating outcomes of infectious diseases such as HIV 1 and 2 in the population outside of only malaria? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, there's a long history of the connection with HIV and transfusion, as everybody knows. I will tell you that under the Bush two administration, there was a big federal dollar that the American taxpayers are paying for called PEPFAR. And that was the president's emergency fund for the treatment of HIV emergency, basically. And um, that money went to different countries, many different countries, not all in Africa, but quite a few in Africa. And in those dollars, they actually allocated a proportion of that to transfusion because the, it was known, recognized, and a concern that the HIV was being transmitted through the blood supply as well. Um, and those dollars used to really lift up quite a few countries' national transfusion services. Um, the, the, the big sort of elephant in the room is its sustainability was not there. Um, and it's up for renewal, but it hasn't, it, it has been scaled back in how much those dollars support transfusion. Um, but, you know, back to this, it is absolutely true that as the um, as the prevalence of and PEPFAR is, can be credited as well as local government money, all the other things that have been done to prevent HIV, that the transfusion transmission also has gone down as the rate in the population has gone down. But it remains a concern. Um, and it's sort of like we have to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time. Like we have to do we have to do all of it. Um, yeah. Hope that answers your question. Um, I have a question. Given the um, disease load and the cost to society of that of the disease load, would it make economic sense to implement pathogen reduction? Um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, I know that there's a you know a, a big um, a big first step that has to be taken, but if you balance everything, what do you think? Well, I think the answer is yes. And again, back to the walk and chew gum at the same, like everything has to, we need more donors, we need better testing. And hey, if we can do it, let's see if we can do pathogen reduction. So, you know, as you know, Dr. Cohen, uh, Dr. Tobian at 
Hopkins and the, the Marisol company is actually leading a study in Uganda right now about using the, the Marisol product to do whole blood pathogen reduction in Uganda. Um, I think they might be doing it in other countries too, but I'm pretty sure the study is based in Uganda. There's also been some studies out of Ghana. Um, and, and the beautiful thing about pathogen reduction is that it will, you know, my comments about malaria, it will also should take care of any malaria in the, in the blood as well. Um, and so I think there's promise there. So that's the good news. The bad news is I, I still struggle as someone who's been to the countries a lot and worked with a lot of the scientists and physicians there. I don't know where the money is going to come from um, because it's just such a, it, 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 at least, you know, in the U.S., our experience is it's a more expensive way to do things. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, I, I struggle with seeing how that can be broadly used as one issue. And then the other issue is that, you know, in Kenya, Nairobi has pretty sophisticated blood transfusion services, but the pictures I was showing you is in the north, and it's very different. And so how are you going to do passage? You know, the, 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 the amount of blood collected is not reaching all edges of the country. And so we still have a long way to go. Are there any other questions? Yeah, uh, this is Bharat Kyagarajan here. I had a question. Um, so Dr. Lenny, I really enjoyed your talk. And I was wondering, you, know, you had mentioned that you know, there are multiple competing needs uh, for limited amount of money to the uh, Ministry of Health at various uh, countries. I was wondering whether you had a sense of what's the amount of money needed uh, per capita to establish a safe transmission supply. Um, you know, I don't know. Sure. Should, should we try to model that together? Because I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I talked. I was sitting in uh, northern Kenya with this this uh, this guy, Mr. Gilchrist. He's a, the county executive for health. And Kenya has gone through this devolution process. So think of it a bit more like the United States that has the state handling state Medicaid dollars, right? Whereas instead of national handling everything. Um, and he was saying to me, you know, in my health budget, you know, I have three big things. Food for the patients, um, petrol, gas to drive the cars around that we need to go do things, and medicine. And, you know blood kind of gets put under medicine and about some part, some way through the year, we run out of, we're done, the budget's used. I'm saying that because that just shows you the sort of the reality, right? So, um, but I, I think, you know, based on that modeling study I showed you, I actually feel like there's probably additional modeling studies that could be done that could be helpful um, to talk about that financial aspect. And, you know, there's collaborators that want to talk about that with me, I'd be happy to. Um, because, you know, I think it, the computational outcomes that I showed with that first paper, they really do tell a story. And as that news media, you know, we just, we have to keep talking about it. And as the news coverage showed, it does galvanize people more when they, they think about it. Um, when I first started in this field, um, and I am not the first person to be fo focused on this, there's lots of great uh, people working in this field. I remember I got to a meeting with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I was so excited. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, it wasn't the leaders of it, but, you know, people that make decisions. And they said to me, you know, they do HIV, pneumonia, you know, and they, they do mostly disease specific stuff. And they said to me, you know, blood transfusion is really complicated in terms of like them deciding to fund it. And it was kind of disappointing. I, I don't know if they would feel that way now. That meeting was 10 years ago. But I remember being like, and, and it is complicated and wrapped up with, risks and things. So um, so it hasn't, I think it, until the NIH steps forward with blood safe, um, and there's some Nordic countries that do contribute, and there's a lot of education happening um, in the Nordic universities for transfusion practitioners in Africa in particular. But, you know, we need more. We, we, it, it needs more attention and more recognition that it's really a healthcare infrastructure issue um, that needs uh, funding and policy. We have just uh, two minutes left. Any other questions? I have a quick question. My name is Amy Beckman. I'm one of the hematopathologists. But in my prior life, years and years ago, I was in the Peace Corps in Northwest Africa. And so it's so I find it so interesting to hear your stories. And frankly, 
when I think back to where I lived, it is just astounding to me that you have been able to gather all this data in these in parts of the world that can be really hard to get to and um, where a lot of tracking is not done. And so I have just a really general question for you. It just seems like there's so many barriers to doing this from training and personnel to infrastructure, like just reliable access to electricity. And like you pointed out, the fact that machines break down and there's no one to fix them. And then you've got issues of supply. Who are your blood donors? And that relates, I think, to community trust. Or do, does the community trust the hospital or the blood donation facility enough to actually give blood? And then you've got the safety issues of either um, of the blood itself or of patients receiving the blood. And so I wondered when you think about this in, say, a community that you've seen, where do you even start? What is the first thing that you would try to help a community improve in order to start on this very long journey towards being able to make this complex resource available in well, Amy, you know, I, I admire you for doing the Peace Corps. I guess you know, I would say it, starts, it starts from within, right, from this self-motivation. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I feel like it's kind of um, make, you know, for the younger folks earlier in their career, you know, seek out um, experiences. It's hard. And also in our academic world in the U.S., to have this be part of your research portfolio is hard. Um, I've, I've been lucky and I've been creative <laughs> in finding ways to, to insert myself. Um, but, you know, the AA, for transfusion in particular, the AABB does have a global transfusion forum. Um, and we have people from all over the world, transfusion service leaders on these calls and, and honestly just starting by coming to the calls and listening, um, finding way, you know, if there's HBO health volunteers overseas, that also is not super focused on our field, but um, in pathology, but but my place a pathologist um, also sponsor, I participate in the ASH scholars program where I bring physicians over to the US for training and then you know going back for a visit um, and helping them write a paper. I mean, some of the stuff I showed you is like, I, I'm doing a project myself. I'm gonna come and we're gonna we're gonna do this together, you know? Um, so it's I always say a lot of what I've shown you is on a shoestring um, and, you know, and, but doing the Peace Corps, stepping up, raising your hand. I mean, to me, that, that is just so admirable. So just getting involved and, and, and finding out more. But also one last thing is ASCP for anatomic pathology, I believe has a real big initiative about connecting anatomic pathologists with, with hospitals overseas that need anatomic pathology support. Um, you know, I just heard there's a program, they're starting to start a clinical pathology program in Ethiopia. And by the way, they're looking for people to go and train in Ethiopia as, as a clinical pathologist. They already are trained in AP. I um, mean, they want people to do residence uh, like a, in country. If anybody's interested that's a clinical pathologist, email me. Um, so, so there's opportunities. Um, I always describe this as my passion that I keep weaving through because I have this other job. I run the lab here and, you know, do the work in the U.S. But you can keep it alive if you if you try and, and, and just are creative and willing to help people that ask you that need help. Hey, thank you. Um, we're out of time. Um, and this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, giving this presentation. And thanks to everybody in the department for your great questions. Thanks for the Take invitation, care. everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye-bye.